Good morning everyone, Country Flyboy here. Today we are continuing the A2A Cessna 172 tutorial. Uh, today's video is going to be startup and uh, a few things have happened since the recording of the last one. Number one, about a week has gone by. I, I wasn't able to record the, uh, then the startup video immediately after the pre-flight one like I wanted to, but you know, shit happens. So it's another day, another new weather, so don't be alarmed if the weather is different. But uh, I've set the aircraft up exactly how it was, and uh, so we should be able to get everything done pretty quickly. And uh, it's early in the morning, and roughly around 9 o'clock or somewhere, and somewhere around there, maybe closer to 10. I got my coffee, and I am ready to go, so let me get my checklist. Uh, engine start. Now, before we go into the startup, we need to talk about the engine this plane has. This plane has a Lycoming 180 horsepower engine. Uh, well, this is the R model, actually. Its, its engine has less horsepower than the 172S. Uh, I think it's like a 160 horsepower engine. Like I said, I got my pilot's license in a 172SP. And that has the 180 horsepower engine. This one has a, uh, a slightly weaker engine. The airplane's also a little bit lighter weight than the 172 SP. So its performance characteristics are about the same. Now, we have stuck on the 172 S prop, which gives us more RPM up to 2700 and 180 horsepower. Versus if we took that off, we get the 160 horsepower at 2400 RPM, which is the 172R factory stock prop. But we have the 76-inch uh, 60-degree fixed pitch S172S equivalent on this airplane. So we have the same performance characteristics as the 172SP. But we're still a little bit lighter weight than the 172SP. So we might be slightly better. All right. Okay, so the Lycoming 180 horsepower engine. There's a uh, acronym we use to remember the details about that engine, and that acronym is Florida Hand. F L H A N D, and what that means is F fuel injected. It's a fuel injected engine. Enough said there. L is Lycoming 180 horsepower. H is horizontally opposed. That means it's an inline engine. It's got the cylinders arranged in a 180 degree line directly opposing one another. So unlike a car where it's aligned in a V and unlike a tractor where it's straight up and down. This is a horizontally opposed engine. The A is air cooled. This is an air cooled engine. Uh, basically the way that mean what that means is uh, the air going in these these two big openings here um, slides through the fins and the cylinders. You can see them there and takes the heat away from the cylinders. And that's what that does. Um, you can also cool the engine two other ways. One, the oil. The uh, you got to make sure you have at least enough oil to run the engine, which is a minimum of six quarts or seven for a cross country. Uh, the reason being is the oil is used sort of like a radiator. The oil is pulling heat from the cylinders and pumped into a an oil cooler down towards the bottom of the engine where the oil is cooled off and then put back in the engine to repeat the process. That's why you need at least six quarts. Now, I said earlier, or at least I think I did, that if you have an oil leak, you can the engine can actually run on as low as two quarts of oil. It can still cool the engine with as few as two quarts. That's how uh, Lycoming designed the engine. That doesn't mean you want to run it that low. <laughs> but that, that is as low as it can get before it starts messing up. Okay. Also, the other way to cool the engine is with proper fuel control. The more um, rich a mixture is, the cooler it will burn. Okay, the N is normally aspirated. Uh, see that air filter down there? The air that goes into that filter is what goes into the cylinders. Normally aspirated means there's no turbocharger, no supercharger, no compressor or anything. The air is uncompressed, unaltered, goes straight into the cylinders. D is direct drive. That means the uh, 
the propeller is bolted directly to the crankshaft so that prop is spinning as fast as the engine is turning uh, on an in airplane like a, uh, a beach king air you have a shaft drive engine you have a well first it's a turbo prop so it's a jet engine with a gearbox and shaft that turns the prop not a direct drive engine on uh, other airplanes like the Cessna 206 you have a constant speed prop and there's a governor and two shafts between the engine and the uh, prop so that's not a direct drive engine that is uh, something else this is a direct drive engine so you know only that basically means there's only one control for the engine and that is the throttle not a prop lever like you would see on a 172 206 or 182 so that's details about the engine um, Let's look at the startup. For some reason, the battery sound is on. I don't know why the battery's off. All right, I'm gonna get the uh, GPS out of the way real quick. As soon as I find the button for it, there. And if I move us over here, Here we can see all the engine controls we need to or gauges we need to worry about. Here's fuel. Remember what I said earlier. Cessna has a bad habit of making fuel gauges that lie to you. Now over here we have fuel flow in gallons per hour and exhaust gas temperature. This little knob here lets you set an exhaust gas temp reference, which is used in uh, leaning the the fuel mixture. You can also use it to set a maximum. Like if you see the EGT go above that line, you know, well, you probably need to do something about it. Okay, down here is the more important one. We have oil temperature and pressure. Now, when you first start the airplane, especially in the winter, oil temperature may be pretty low. It may be below green arc for a while before the engine starts to warm up. That's why you want to run the uh, engine at low RPMs first, especially during the winter on cold days. Uh, if before you even start taxiing, you really want to let the, the oil at least get into the green arc or close to it by running the engine at low RPMs, around about a thousand, before uh, before starting the taxi. It doesn't take long. Normally, by the time you finish your uh, setup for everything, it should be uh, in the green arc at least a little bit. Now the pressure, gotta keep a close eye on it. The uh, pressure has a very tight range as you can see just shy of uh, 60 and just uh, above 100 psi that oil pressure on startup should rise up to the green arc within 30 seconds of the engine turning over and starting so within 30 seconds of you shoving that fuel mixture in which we'll talk about later that thing should rise up to green arc even at idle or yeah right in green arc. If it doesn't, you have a problem and should immediately shut down the engine. And at all times, that oil pressure should be in the green arc. Okay, the vacuum gauge. Again, you want to keep it in the green arc. This indicates how much vacuum pressure you have. Again, vacuum drives the uh, artificial horizon attitude indicator up here. Vacuum also drives the HSI, so, well, HSI heading indicator, sorry. So you want to make sure that that right there is working. Okay. Amp meter. That shows whether or not you have a discharge or a uh, surge or anything like that. Uh, it should read during normal operations at or close to zero. If it reads in the plus ranges pointing up, that means you're charging. If it reads in the negative ranges, if I flip the battery on here, that means you're discharging. That refers to the battery. So you're charging the battery and discharging the battery. It should read at zero or a little higher during normal flight operations. It's not It's not a bad thing to see it above zero, but you definitely don't want to see it get too high. Now, let me flip to the proper page in the manual here so I make sure I get my facts right. It's been a while. The uh, the battery in this airplane is slightly weaker than the alternator, than the power the alternator puts out. There's a reason for that. 
And it's a pretty ingenious reason that the engineers at Cessna came up with. The airplane is equipped with a 28 volt direct current electrical system. The system is powered by a belt driven 60 amp alternator with a 24 volt battery. So, the airplane pulls 28 volts. The battery is 24 volts. The alternator will put out at least 26 volts or more. Why is the battery weaker than the alternator? That way you always have a charge going on. And the system pulls more power, that way you always have power being pulled. <laughs> you don't want it to just sit around, you want it to actually be doing its job. So, that's enough on that. I think we're pretty much ready for start. Now, <clears throat> let's go into, let me get a drink of my coffee. Mm. Starting to cool off. It's getting nasty. <clears throat> now, let's go into the startup procedure. Unlike the default 172 and the Coronado ones, we actually start this engine with the fuel mixture in the cutoff position. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to prime the engine so there is fuel in the cylinders, and that priming will let the engine start and run for a couple of seconds. <clears throat> Basically, we want to see the engine start up and run before we start feeding it fuel. Now, in the uh, default and the Carnado ones, they operate more like a carburetor engine. In a carburetor engine, you actually start the engine with the fuel mixture at full rich. And you usually have a priming knob. This airplane doesn't have a priming knob. You prime with the fuel pump and the fuel mixture and throttle. All right. So, before start checklist, pre-flight is complete passenger briefing. On those, uh, nobody does those in flight sim. At least I hope not, because that's just weird. Heidi, as pretty as she is, is not a real person. She's about my age, though. <laughs> okay. She's not a real person. This is a simulator, not the real thing, so wouldn't worry about that. Seat backs and seat tracks, seat belts adjusted and locked. What you want to do here is make sure your seat belt's fastened, door is closed. By the way, you can't really uh you can't really um fasten your seat belt with the door closed. You got to you got to fasten the seat belt then close the door. That's just how it works. That's the way that it's designed for some reason. So what you want to do is just jolt your seat forward in the real aircraft. Don't do it for real and in a simulator. And that makes sure the seat is locked on the track. Brakes test. Uh, make sure your brakes work just by doing the brake button. Trigger on my joystick. Or whatever your brakes are. If you are lucky enough to have actual pedals. In the real aircraft, what you would do is press forward on the brakes, which is pressing the top of the rudder pedal. And uh, that you're just looking to make sure they're firm. They should have some firmness to them. Circuit breakers, they're all in. There's uh, these circuit breakers here. They're all good. Avi let's see. Electrical equipment off. The only thing that can be on right here is the beacon light. If it's in the on position, that's fine. Some people like to leave it that way. I don't. I like to flip it off. Alright, Avionics Master is off. Fuel selector in the both position. Fuel shutoff valve is in. Engine start checklist. Hold on a second. Phone was ringing. It was a fucking recording. Um, engine start checklist. We have five items to do on the engine start checklist. Now, there's actually 20 items on it, but the first five are the ones we need to worry about, and the last six are the ones we need to worry about. The others are memory items, because they're done in a flow. And uh, that flow is pretty sim simple. Uh, just to reiterate, a, a checklist is divided into two things. Uh, the checklist itself plus the memory items. Memory items usually stand out from the rest. And they're things you need to do from memory in the form of a flow. Otherwise, you know, you do them, then you use the checklist. That's how I like to do my checklist. Early on, during some people's training, and some pilots even after getting their license, like to 
use a checklist as a do list where uh, you find the item on the checklist, do it, move on. Versus most pilots, and the way it's done in the airline world, and the way I like to do it personally, is uh, memory items mostly. Uh, this comes from it comes with time and experience. There's no really way to learn it. You just got to do it till you you get it in repetition to the point that you could do it in your sleep. Then you're doing it correctly, or at least the way I like to do it. Both. There's nothing wrong with either way. They had the pros and cons. All right. So engine start checklist. Now, the, the 172 is perfectly capable of starting with a ground power unit, but most checklists only have the start with battery unit, and that's the only way you can start the A2A 172. I really wish they would have modeled the GPU, but they didn't. Okay, so throttle. Quarter of an inch. Real life, you literally just bump that throttle. That's it. That's Real life, that's a quarter of an inch right there. I barely moved it. See, watch it. Watch it closely. That's a quarter of an inch. That's idle. That's a quarter of an inch. <laughs> now, that's how it is in real life. And the A2A, it's a little bit more. You want to bring it about even with the fuel mixture there. Right about there. That might actually be too much, but oh, oh well. Mixture, idle cutoff. Propeller area, clear. We would stick our head out the window and yell, clear. Master switch, on. All right, and the beacon on. Again, if the switch was already in that beacon on position, the second you turn the master battery on, the beacon light would have came on. All right, that's the first five. Everything else is a memory item. Okay, so this is the priming procedure. Throttle full, fuel pump on, mixture full rich. Look for a rise on the fuel flow. You should see a good rise for at least three seconds, and we have it. Mixture out, fuel pump out, throttle out back to a quarter of an inch. Now, you can also prime it another way. We'll get into that when we uh, start the engine up. Now, on hot summer days like today, you also want to let the engine sit for a second to let those fuel vapors build up in the engine. It's set long enough, so we're going to start this bird up now. Have your hand on the control shift F4 keys, and then grab the mag with the mouse. Wait for it to start. There it is. Fuel mixture full rich. Notice the engine started up before I moved the mixture into the full rich. We have oil pressure rising. Oil pressure's in the green arc. Okay. We're just shy of a thousand, so I'll bump the throttle up a bit. And at this point, you want to lean the mixture out roughly about three quarters to a half away position. Alright, so we have fuel pressure, or oil pressure is good. Attack is good, and we have a charging on the battery. So we're good. So raise the flaps and avionics on. I forgot to turn the alternator on. Sorry. They'll always check that. I thought I flipped it on with the battery, but I guess not. All right. Now that the uh, engine has started up, the flow is complete. We made sure everything was in the green before we uh, started turning stuff on. All right, so the continue the checklist. After the engine starts, all pressure is in the green. Uh, fuel pump is off. Low voltage lights are off. Nav taxi light uh, off. Avionics on. Radios on. Flaps up. Now, uh, regarding the nav and taxi lights, uh, a lot of people like to turn them on for daylight operations, even VFR. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you have them, you might as well use them. But just so you know, in real life, at least what we did is, the only light we really had during ground operations was the beacon light during the day. Now, during the night, yeah, we turned the nav light on too. But... During day VFR ops, all you need is the beacon light. There's no reason to turn on any of the other ones. For one, you can hardly see them during the day. Like, even in the sim, look. You can barely see that. And you can't see it from here because there's a hangar in the way. But, yeah, you can, you can hardly see them in real life. The landing and strobe lights are the only two you can really see in real life. And even the strobe lights are hard to see. 
during the day. So all you really need on is the beacon light. <clears throat> Again, that just serves as a warning for everyone else. Now, before we started the engine, I discussed there was two ways of priming. There's, I followed the checklist I have, which is the full throttle prime. <clears throat> the other way to prime is to leave the throttle at a quarter of an inch and just do the fuel pump mixture thing. You get less of a rise when you do that, but you should still be able to uh, start the engine with that. Uh, when you're doing that, if you're doing the quarter of an inch in priming and you're not getting enough ri of enough of a rise, or at least you don't think you are, you can always, while the stuff is on, bump that fuel, bump that throttle in a little bit, and it gets more fuel going into the engine. Now the reason we lean the fuel mixture out when we're operating on the ground is we're operating at low RPM levels. We're only leave the fuel mixture leaned out a bit because it won't. It'll foul the plugs if you're running at a high, high mixture during low RPM. So we want to lean it out so we avoid fouling the plugs. It also lets the oil come up to temperature quicker on a cold day, which it rose up pretty fast today because it's summer. Alright, let me stick my GPS back on the window. This is where you would normally get your ATIS briefing is the first item on the checklist. This aircraft does not, or this airport, sorry, has no ATIS. In fact, it doesn't have ASOS. It doesn't have squat here. There's nothing here. There's no fuel service. There's no weather anything. Uh, we're quite literally a, a one paved strip of runway in the middle of the wilderness. There's nothing here but a few hangars and about five airplanes. So how would we set our altimeter? Well, pretty simply actually. We set the field elevation. So I'm going to set the altimeter to zero. There we go. Now if you set it to zero before you take off, and now you're indicating your height above field elevation. But uh, I'll set it to zero for now. We know this airfield has a 60 foot elevation. But just to verify, we'll check. Yep, 68 feet field elevation. So we want to set the altimeter to around 70 feet. Now we do that with the knob here. In real life, you almost this type of altimeter, you almost always end up setting it by field elevation because the Colesman window right here, believe it or not, is pretty hard to read. In fact, you you can see you can barely read it here. That's pretty much how it is in real life. You can barely read it in real life too. It's tiny, trust me. So I'll zoom in on it here so you can see. Uh, I'll set it to the field elevation. That's 20 feet, 2, 34, 60 feet. There's, there's 1,000, 90, 80, 70, 60. So right there. So we're looking at a pressure today about 3010. That's the uh, pressure right now. All right, so altimeter is set by field elevation. Uh, you can always just hit the B key to check your accuracy for it, but uh, I, I like to avoid pressing B. It gets you into a bad habit. Plus, when you're descending into your airport, your pressure may be different. Pressing B does not set it to the, uh, the pressure of your destination airport or any airport in real life. It sets it to the pressure that you're currently in. So you always want to avoid pushing B. Just set it manually. Plus, in real life, you don't have the advantage of a key that magically sets the pressure. All right, transponder is set squat code, set the standby. Uh, that has changed a bit late recently. Normally, you would set it to standby and set your squat code. But in real life, by the way, we're going to be squawking VFR. They've changed it now. They recommend you have the transponder on the on position during the ground. And before you take off, you move it to alt altitude. And we're going to test it real quick. Move it to the test position. Everything looks good. Move it to the on position. So in real life now, they want you to have the transponder in the on position in ground operations on aircraft where you can sled it. The aircraft I flew in real life had G1000 avionics, and it automatically set the transponder for you. You didn't have to worry about it. You could manually change it, but uh, it set it automatically by itself. So we don't have to worry about that in G1000 aircraft. Now, the next thing we want to look at 
is the taxi checklist, which uh, will be in the next video. This one's getting longer than it should. So that's engine startup, and the aircraft is now configured and ready for taxi. It has somehow moved forward off of the, the pavement. I don't know how, but uh, that's probably a good thing for what I want to show you during the taxi. So it's at this point I like to make sure everything is set up for my flight before I start taxiing. My radios are set, and I'm going to set my views up too. I like to set this view here. Turn it that way a bit. That way when I cycle my views with the uh, button on my joystick, it goes to all the views I like first. So that's startup. Next will be taxi and before takeoff stuff. Uh, probably the takeoff there too. Alright, hope you enjoyed it and see you next time. Down deflection when it's just sitting there like that. You want to move it with your hand slowly up and down, full deflection. What you're looking for is to make sure there's nothing blocking the elevator. And one thing I like to do is move it full down and sort of put the tipping 